Good afternoon, Club 17. It, hey, it's good to be back together. Uh, great to have people here at the Hilton in the pavilion room, and great to have people joining us online via Zoom. We appreciate every person's participation. And we've got a great program today. I'll say more about that in just a few minutes. And for those here in the room, I want you to know it's not that we didn't think you showered this morning, but we decided that we would be compliant with all the right health orders. So we do have everyone seated per household at their own separate table, which is the way things are at the moment. So thank you as Rotarians, being flexible, we always are flexible. And now we're gonna start uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now we are gonna have the invocation and four-way test led by Nancy Reese. Thank you, President Brett. Please join me in praying. <clears throat> Most gracious and loving God, we gather today mindful of the many blessings you have bestowed on us as individuals and as members of our Rotary Club of Cincinnati. We thank you for each and everyone who is here today and with us virtually. We are grateful for this opportunity to bring people together to share fellowship, friendship, and food. As Rotarians, our vision is a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. You have blessed our Rotary Club with caring, generous people who seek to serve. May we realize that our education, our prosperity, and our influence are both a privilege and a responsibility to be used to build a more peaceful and just world particularly during this unusual time. May our vision and our purpose of providing humanitarian service, encouraging high ethical standards in all vocations, and building goodwill and peace in the world be strengthened by your grace and guided by your commandment to love and serve. We are grateful for our speaker, Peter Bronson, who has spent his career helping us to be informed and to better understand ourselves, other people, and the world around us. Please bless the food we are enjoying and those who prepared it and served it. May the food nourish us and the fellowship enrich our lives. Amen. Oops. The four-way test, I almost forgot. It's not in front of me. Um, please. Recite with me our four-way test of things that we think, say, and do as Rotarians. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. So I'm playing the sergeant at arms today, and we've got a, a guest with us to, uh, that I'd like to introduce, Mark Scott. Mark, if you could just stand up. And Mar Mark is at First Commonwealth Bank, Commonwealth Bank, and he's in charge or involved with institutional lending. And he's a guest of Esteban Calle. Esteban, if you could stand up a minute too. Thank you. And I know we haven't met in person in a number of months. Uh, I would like to do a partial introduction of a new member who joined in November, but there hasn't been an opportunity. The full introduction will happen later. Uh, his sponsor is Dave Carlin. And our new member is Chuck Martz. Chuck, if you could stand up a minute and stay standing. And as I said, Chuck joined in November. He's a former Rotary Club president from Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, the same area Marilyn and I used to live in before he moved here. 
And the other thing I want to mention about Chuck, uh, among his many rotary experiences, is he's done uh, global projects and helped work on grant writing. And as a matter of fact, last night there was a district grant writing seminar. And Chuck and a number of us in the club were part of that. So Chuck, thanks for getting involved so quickly. Now I have some other announcements today. First of all, just a reminder that when you finish eating, you would put your face mask back on. Um, we are following all the protocols, which is the right thing to do. And we have some birthdays to celebrate this week. February 2nd, Christy Shushek. February 3rd, Brad Green. February 5th, Thomas Bain. And February 8th, Emily Lichtenberg. Let's give them a big round of applause. Happy birthday. And, and Christy, thank you for all you do for the club. Much appreciated. Now, if you uh, were at the club assembly, joined via Zoom last week, uh, we had a great chance to give updates on what our club has been doing the first six months of this Rotary year. And one of the things you heard about, and you've seen it in the weekly E-Rays, is we've got an environmental task force in this club, chaired uh, by Jody Devoid and Deborah Schultz. Uh, that task force has been working on identifying and vetting projects that our club could do to help locally to support the environment. As you've probably seen, there's three projects that that team has recommended. And if you go to this week's Rotary, of Rotary. This week's E-Raise, uh, you will um, see the, a link. You can click on that and take a survey. Vote for the project that you prefer our club to start with, and there is an explanation of each one. Each one has a link that gives more description. Voting ends tomorrow, so if you want to vote, get your vote in, and a whole bunch of Rotarians have already voted, which is great to see. And Rotary Club Professional Development Series started in January. And next week, February 11th, we've got the second session. This is a program uh, being chaired, the committee's being chaired by Terry Dean. And the program next Thursday is Doug Bolton is going to speak on commercial real estate and what COVID's impact has been in the greater Cincinnati area. So it should be a great presentation. Doug um, knows so many people in the city and area. He's got a great panel of commercial real estate people who will be part of that discussion. Again, that's Thursday, next Thursday, 10.15 to 11.30 a.m. If you'd like to be part of that, please uh, send an email to the club office. Tomorrow is the deadline to register. And a lot of us know that Doug was the former reporter, editor, and publisher of the Business Courier. I think a number of us know that he was also a managing principal at Cushman and Wakefield. So Doug's got a wonderful background to head this up. Much appreciated. And annual Jefferson Awards. Uh, a week from tomorrow, February 12th, is the deadline to nominate an organization for a Jefferson Award. This is a wonderful program. Uh, it is something that we have run or coordinated as a club for the last 16 years. We've had a number of local winners have gone on to win the national award. So been very positive. If you'd like to do a nomination, there's an online form. You can just go to e and click on it and fill it out. And I just want to thank Bill Shula is here today. I don't think uh, Doug Adams is here today. Bill Shula and Doug Adams are the co-chair for the award committee. So thank you very much for doing that. And I think this, if the battery on this mic might be cutting in and out, we'll find out. If, if so, I'll switch to another one. Uh, hands on service. There have been a whole bunch of projects this year, more than 12, and many of them focused on community efforts. We've had one that had to be focused on a club effort, which is moving the Rotary office. And we moved on up from the 21st floor to the 41st floor of Karoo Tower into our wonderful new space with a great view. And that being said, we had a lot of club members help with that move. So in addition to 
Linda and Christy and Deanne on our staff working really hard to make that happen. We also had a number of other members working on that move. And let me thank Bob McElroy, Thomas Bain, Owen Rassman, Bob and Mary Brandstetter, Carl Kappas, and Bill Stilley. A big thanks to you all. And just a reminder that our hands-on service project for the month of February is a blood drive that we're doing in partnership with Hawksworth Blood Center. And it's really easy to do. Uh, if you go to E-Rays, you'll see the seven Hawksworth sites in Greater Cincinnati listed. You can click on a link for the contact information for a neighborhood blood donor site near you. And uh, if you do that and go, take a selfie. Send it to the Rotary office. And you can use code CRT, uh, which tells them that you're part of Cincinnati Rotary Club and you're donating as part of our month of February effort. This is all an e-raise, but just a reminder. And now some members in the news. On a sad note, we received word that longtime Rotarian Tom Lippard passed away at his home in Florida last weekend. Uh, Linda Muth has just put out some additional information in an email today, but as we get more information, we will make sure to send that and make that available as well. Many of us knew Tom. Uh, he was a longtime member, I think about 30 years in our club. Very sad, so please keep his family in your thoughts and prayers. And on, on a happier note, I'm thrilled to announce that our club member, Josiel Ehrlich, has been elected Vice Chairperson of the International Association of Better Business Bureaus. That's the national umbrella organization for independent bus better business bureaus across North America. Congratulations, Joe Seal. <laughs> and next week's meeting, our speaker will be Jill Miller. She is the president of Bethesda Inc. Should be a great presentation. Please join us for that. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. We are very pleased to have with us a man that I think many of us know from his writings and some of us know previously in person as well, Peter Bronson. Peter is a former reporter, editor, and columnist with the Cincinnati Inquirer. He's also a local historian. And Peter's the author of a number of books, including Forbidden Fruit, and was editorial page editor and columnist, as I said, for Cincinnati Inquirer for nearly 20 years. And under his leadership, the Inquirer was judged best editorial page in Ohio four years in a row. Before coming to Cincinnati in 1992, he was editorial page editor and columnist at the Tucson Citizen in Tucson, Arizona. He started his news career in Michigan after graduating from Michigan State University in his hometown of East Lansing. Peter has served on several nonprofits, including Casa de los Niños, Home for Abused Children in Tucson, Northern Kentucky Children's Home, Leadership Cincinnati, and Cincinnati Right to Life. He was a regular panelist and producer on the Channel 9 WCPO TV show Hot Seat, and also on the weekly Tucson news show Arizona Illustrated. He's been a contributing editor and columnist at Cincy Magazine, and now is owner and publisher of Chili Dog Press, which offers publishing, writing, editing, and consulting. His 2005 book, Behind the Lines, The Untold Stories of the Cincinnati Riots, was a regional bestseller. He's also co-author of Legacy of Courage, The True Stories of Honor Flight Veterans, and Leg Legacy of Courage II. And Chili Dog Press has published dozens of books, including Judge Z, Irretrievably Broken, Dance When You Can, and the national award-winning Submerged. He's an active group leader at Horizon Community Church. He enjoys working on old sports cars. We'll have to find out what models, what kinds, maybe an Austin Healey or something else. And playing golf and travel. He's the father of two and lives with his wife, Kathy and Milford. Please join me in welcoming Peter Bronson to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati.
Good afternoon, and it's uh, nice to be back here at Rotary with my friends at Rotary. I never joined Rotary because I couldn't pass that four-way test. It was The truth part was okay, but uh, was it uh, kind and beneficial to all? I don't know. <laughs> Some of my columns, I kind of heard that they weren't. Um, and uh, just for the record, the sports car was a 1977 MGB, and I'm sure that everybody knows a fraternity brother or a brother or friend or cousin who had one of those, and they never started, and the lights never worked, right? Yeah, well, I had a lot of fun with it. And uh, I had a lot of fun with this book, too. It's uh, something that I've been meaning to do for a long time because I always thought that the Supper Club fire was the biggest story in our region, bar none. Uh, nothing can touch it. Um, and what I had set out to do when I started this book was to tell the story of the Supper Club, but also put it in context of the history of Northern Kentucky. And I'd heard for years when I came here in 92 about how wild Newport used to be and Covington and how organized crime was involved behind the scenes. Well, I've got to, I got to tell you, I had no idea, really no idea. What I found was pretty incredible. So let's get started here. And uh, if I go too long, because I can talk about this forever, if I go too long, Brett, please raise your hand or something and let me know so I can save time for questions. Let's start right here. Um, let's see. There we go. Probably this picture is familiar to a lot of you. This is the Supper Club fire on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, you, you know, what I said in the introduction is that this story uh, brushed families throughout our region. And since I published this book, I haven't been able to um, talk to anybody about it who doesn't have a story about a neighbor, a friend, a family member. Many of them are tragic, many of them are narrow escapes, and many are just, hey, my family and my, my parents used to go to the supper club all the time, or I went to the supper club, and it was spectacular. It was. Here's a picture of the uh, investigators going through the remains the day after. They sifted the uh, remains, and what they found was tragic and touching. These are the personal items that were retrieved, and they uh, speak eloquently of the common lives of everyday people who were lost in this fire. What we see here is uh, shoes, uh, car keys, purses, wallets, rings, watches, eyeglasses, sunglasses, uh, on and on it goes. And... Uh, in many cases, the only way people could be identified was with their personal items that family members recognized. You uh, also may recognize this monument to the Supper Club that was put up by one of the survivors, Wayne Dammert, who was also one of the heroes of the Supper Club. He was the banquet captain on the second floor when the fire started, and he rescued more than 75 people by leading them to safety. The lights went out, of course, during the fire. Uh, it was totally pitch black. The smoke was so thick and black, it was uh, totally choking everybody. And somehow they managed to find their way down a hallway and found one door that they could find that was open that led down to the kitchen where they were able to get out. Well, here's what I started to find out when I did the history and the research. The Supper Club was originally the Beverly Hills Country Club. Well, many of you may know that. This was um, a, a kind of a roadhouse nightclub that was set up by a gambler and gangster named Pete Schmidt who was originally part of the George Remus gang. Now, many of you probably know George Remus was, bar none, the most successful and biggest bootlegger in U.S. history. He uh, controlled bootleg all over the nation because Newport was the place where he could buy all of the government, buy the police, buy the prosecutors, the judges, everybody, and still reach everything he needed to get to geographically, Chicago, East Coast, throughout the Midwest. Pete Schmidt was a member of that gang, and he set up this nightclub. Here's a picture of Pete Schmidt at the police station in Newport. The police were his friends, not because they liked him, but because he paid them generously. Uh, we'll find out as we go through, and I found out, that Newport was pretty much in totally in the grip of organized crime for 40 years. And organized crime controlled everything, all the way to the governor's office. Here's a picture of what the, the uh, country club, Pete Schmidt's club, looked like. It was spectacular. It had the best entertainment. It was known coast to coast as the, des the destination in the nation if you wanted fine entertainment and wide open gambling. Now, gambling was illegal, but you could get your bootleg whiskey and your wide open gambling, and this was what was known as a carpet joint as opposed to the bust-out joints, 
which were very common on the streets of Newport, where if you walked in there as an unsuspecting convention visitor or uh, somebody who didn't know what's going on, uh, they, they called it a bust-out joint because they made sure you didn't get out of there until you were busted. In many cases, that involved chloral hydrate drops in your drink. It might involve uh, rigged games that were so rigged, people might object, and then they'd get beaten in the alley and robbed. Well, this was a spectacular nightclub, and it was so beautiful, it attracted a lot of attention. Unfortunately for Pete Schmidt, the attention it attracted, attracted was from a man named Mo Dallitz, who was the big boss of the Cleveland Four. The Cleveland Four was the organized crime family, not really a family, like in mafia style, but it was a group of four guys, and they controlled, they came out of the Purple Gang in Detroit, they controlled the Midwest. What happened was uh, all of the organized crime bosses got together and divided the country just as a corporation would divide up territories for franchises. And the Cleveland Four got Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio. Well, they made an offer to Pete Schmidt. They liked his club, they wanted it, he could sell. And they'd give him a generous price and he said no. And he said no repeatedly. And finally, this is what happened. They came in and they sent some men to burn the club. What they didn't know, or maybe didn't care about, was that there was a caretaker there whose girlfriend was staying with him, and she had her five-year-old daughter, or uh, pardon me, sister, with them, and the five-year-old girl was killed. These are the guys who uh, set the fire. Edwin Garrison was a genius of sorts in, in the crime world. They were known in those days as police characters. That would be the headline shorthand. Um, Dave Whitfield was probably one of the ringleaders because the mob looked after him. It took three trials and some of the best lawyers, the best mob lawyers in Newport, uh, defended him until he was finally convicted and immediately when he was released, he got a job as a manager of one of the mob nightclubs. About this time, people began to get upset. Uh, they knew they wanted their bootleg booze, and, uh, but they didn't know they were also making that deal with the devil that would also bring in prostitution, corruption, um, organized crime, beatings, uh, they had what was called the Newport nightgown. For people who got out of line, they would uh, wrap you up in chains and throw you in the Ohio River. This judge uh, was a hero. It, there's no statute that, statue that I know of in Kentucky for him, but there, there really should be. He was brave. He went against the mob all the way to the governor's office. The governor was in the pocket of the mob and his party was in the pocket of the mob, everybody was, but Johnst Northcutt, yes, S-T at the end of his first name, uh, went after him and uh, really went after him in a big way. And in fact, the, in, one, in one trial, the mobsters accused him of carrying a machine gun in one of the raids, and he said, no, machine guns were discussed, but I only carried a handgun. <laughs> so this was some kind of judge. Eventually, the mob got its revenge. He was driven from office and uh, died of a heart attack working in his office where he was still prosecuting cases against mobsters. Here's a picture of the other premier carpet joint in northern Kentucky. It was the Lookout House, and this was run by a guy named Buck Brady, also a member of the Pete Schmidt gang. And it was spectacular also. It wasn't quite there with the Beverly Hills uh, Country Club, but it was very close. And the mob had the Beverly Hills Country Club, and they wanted this one because it was in the neighboring county. And then when, when the, the heat got too big and uh, they had to shut down operations temporarily, uh, if they were being investigated or a grand jury was seated, they could also just keep this open in the next county and nothing would stop. Well, they made an offer to Buck Brady. They sent Red Masterson, who was the enforcer for the Cleveland Four, and they told him, uh, they told Buck Brady again, just like Pete Schmidt, sell or else. And he decided to take things into his own hand. He was no stranger to violence, being part of, Pete, of the uh, George Remus gang. So he laid a trap for Red Masterson and decided to strike first. And he shot him, drove by and uh, shot him with a shotgun in the face. Unfortunately for Buck Brady, he didn't kill Red Masterson. Uh, and Buck Brady was caught later hiding in, uh, near an outhouse and... Uh, promptly decided that, well, if I didn't get him, then I'm going to have to sell the club. So he did. He turned it over. Red Masterson, meanwhile, in the hospital, told the police he had no idea what happened and, and uh, wasn't, wasn't going to press charges. So Buck Brady gave up his club. The mob took over. 
And that just shows you how things operated. Red Masterson was a very scary guy. This is a look at what the country club looked like when the, when the mob ran it. And doesn't it have the appearance of a country club? This is, you can tell if you know your cars, this is a 1962, 63 Cadillac. So all the way into the 60s, the mob was running the Beverly Hills Country Club. The acts that they had there were, would be spectacular today. Uh, Sinatra, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis. Dean Martin started as a dealer in this club. And Jerry Lewis met him and they started doing their act in some of the nightclubs in Northern Kentucky and that's how they got their start. When Pete Schmidt was run out of the country club, he opened this, which we now know as the syndicate. Uh, in these days, it was first Glenn Schmidt's Rendezvous, named after Pete Schmidt's son, and then it later became uh, the Glenn Schmidt Playtorium, which I thought was a genius name. It, it just really expressed the Northern Kentucky vibe of being the adult playground for Cincinnati, which was a kind of a symbiotic relationship. Cincinnati was very careful to make sure uh, with law enforcement that none of this organized crime crossed the river. Uh, there's a side story I'd love to tell, but we don't have time, about the time uh, some gangsters tried to come across and how Cincinnati police responded with uh, Tommy guns. But uh, what happened is, meanwhile, Cincinnati was selling, quietly selling Northern Kentucky and its attractions for the, as the adult playground for what? Conventions. So this hotel and others were full of people who came here, and in those days, Men went to conventions, they didn't take their wives, and that was their big, uh, whatever you call it, their, their time to get away and have fun uh, with all the brothels, the prostitutes, the bootleg whiskey, the casino gambling, you name it. How wild was Northern Kentucky? This is a picture of Big Jim Harris, also known as the boss man, who was the marshal of Wilder and also ran the town's big brothel. He had uh, secret passages, he had, uh, had a setup where he put uh, recorders in each of the rooms and he had the women, the prostitutes, ask key questions of their clients. And then a week later after um, Mr. Rogers or whoever uh, went back to Lansing, Michigan or Kansas City, he'd call them up and play the tape. And of course they were more than happy to pay thousands of dollars for those tapes. What happened was uh, he at one point uh, did get uh, arrested and put in prison for pandering, but he always bragged that he had $64,000 in cash stuffed in his mattress for his legal defense. Big Jim was quite a guy. This is Mo Dallitz. Some of us are old enough to at least have heard from our parents or maybe watched some things on PBS to hear about the Kefauver Commission. That was a senator from Tennessee who made his name by going after organized crime. He went coast to coast and held hearings in city after city to inform the public about the huge and pervasive influence of, of organized crime at all levels of government in all cities. Kefauver uh, dragged these mobsters in and most of the, some of the scenes in The Godfather are modeled after this. And the actual godfather himself is modeled after one of the leading mobsters in New York, Frank Costello. Mo Dallitz was smart. He was very charming. He was humorous. He made people laugh. And he was totally dishonest. Almost nothing came out of his mouth that was true. About this time, too, in the early 60s, George Ratterman uh, finished his career with uh, first Notre Dame and then the New York, New York Giants as a very talented athlete. Um, he played uh, uh, football for Notre Dame, and his coach said he was probably the most gifted quarterback he'd ever seen. George Ratterman was in the financial market here in Cincinnati uh, as a broker, and uh, his neighbors told him that they really were trying. The Committee of 500 came to him and said, we're trying to clean up Newport and Covington, and we really need your help, but we need somebody to run for sheriff. George threw his hat in the ring, and next thing you know, his, uh, he was set up after having several drinks in this hotel and others, uh, he was set up with chloral hydrate drops in his drink and they dragged him across the river and put him in a room upstairs with a stripper named April Flowers. And uh, April Flowers uh, knew all about this. She was in on the, the, the frame up and the Newport police were standing by 
to get their call, and they showed up and, and arrested George and April Flowers, and they actually had tried to get a photographer there to take pictures of it all, but he backed out. He wanted no part of it. So April Flowers, as you may find in the book, turns out to be quite a hero uh, later on, which was a surprise to me because I'd heard this story before, but I'd never heard that part of it. Well, the big deal here about this picture in the middle is that guy, Ron Goldfarb, was the chief assistant to the U.S. Attorney General, Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy was a brand new Attorney General. This was in April. He had just been appointed. He was, uh, really had a chip on his shoulder about overcoming the, um, I guess, the uh, doubts about him because he was the president's brother. And when Jack appointed him, he said, I gave him the job because he needs some job experience, which, you know, obviously he, he didn't have what it took. But Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general, and he sent, he had been battling organized crime, and he had watched Estes Kefauver get national attention, and he said, this is our game. We're going to go after these guys. So he, he realized this was a great opportunity, and he sent Ron Goldfarb to Newport with a blank check to help George Ratterman and to go after the mob. To put this in context, Bobby Kennedy had had some horrific battles against Jimmy Hoffa leading up to this and after it. Their personal um, uh, hostility toward each other is legendary and almost uh, resulted in physical violence at times. Both of them threatened to, to kill or, or ruin the other guy, and it Ultimately, they did. Bobby Kennedy and his family, you have to think back, Joe Kennedy was involved in bootlegging. And he also knew a lot of mobsters, including Sam Giancana, the boss in Chicago. Sam Giancana often bragged, even publicly, that he had delivered the fraudulent votes to elect Jack Kennedy. And their thanks, think about this if you're a mobster, their thanks after getting this, this guy elected and you think he's in your pocket, is that they unleashed Bobby Kennedy to destroy organized crime. And the place that he hit him was in a, a nerve center that was very important to them. It was the, Newport was the national hub of wire betting, which would be what would be the equivalent of online betting today, but at that time meant telephone calls. So you could place bets anywhere in the country and they would go through Newport. This brought billions, hundreds of millions of dollars to organized crime. And here's Bobby Kennedy, all of a sudden, he's going to ruin it for him. Meanwhile, Jack is living the glamorous life in the other Newport, which was where he had his compound in Newport, Rhode Island. It was a real contrast of Bobby fighting this dark war against the underworld in gritty Newport and his brother Jack living this lifestyle. Here's a picture of Jack Kennedy coming to Newport when he campaigned for president. What's so um, poignant about this picture is here he is sitting in an open car on the back. These kinds of motorcades are not done anymore, right? Well, we know why. Because of November 22nd, 1963, he was in an open car doing a motorcade in Dallas when he was shot. Here's a picture of George Ratterman when he was fighting the mob. The new mobster in town that was running uh, Newport was Screw Andrews. And uh, how corrupt were the Newport police? Well, when George Ratterman was serving a warrant on Screw Andrews, the Newport police ticketed his car. He's the sheriff, and, and the, the Newport police were just about as corrupt as it could be. After Bobby Kennedy, uh, really, and George Ratterman, who gets a lot of credit, because he hired his own set of deputies. They were like his own un untouchables. They had not been corrupted by the mob. And they really turned the screws down on organized crime. Well, at that time, organized crime guys like Mo Dallas said, what are we doing here? We can go to Vegas where we can buy the whole state. And that's what they did. They bought the state. Mo Dallas went out and started the Desert Inn and other um, big time casinos. And later said when he was known as Mr. Las Vegas, that everything I know about casinos I learned at the Beverly Hills Country Club. When those guys left, we entered an era of what we call, I call disorganized crime. It was small time hoods. It was the porn industry. And the porn industry was so bad in Newport. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was bad before. There were so many prostitutes in, in Newport during the mob days, the big time mob days, that they had one street for morning customers and another street for evening customers. But when the, organized, the disorganized crime era came along, the porn industry just went wild. 
um, full nude dancing, things that, we, that aren't even tolerated today, um, were just everywhere on, on the streets of Newport. And there's a, a picture of what you could see. About this time, Dick Schilling bought the Beverly Hills, which had been shuttered and closed since 1963, 64, when uh, Bobby Kennedy came to town. And he announced his dream. He had owned the Lookout House, and he sold that and bought this, and he was going to turn it into, again, the showplace of the nation. It burned in 1975 while he was remodeling it. It was arson. The local fire chief actually got a call before the fire uh, was reported by someone who told him that it was going to be burned. Uh, they found two empty gas cans sitting in the middle of the floor, and nobody on the work crews could identify them. It was, uh, the local fire chief said there was absolutely no doubt it was arson in 1975. And uh, then again in 1977, it burns again. Here we see the, the young man who was a teenager at the time and had the courage to walk into, imagine you've got this banquet hall, the cabaret room full of uh, more than thousands of people packed in like as close as they can get. The aisles are full with chairs. It was a fire hazard, don't get me wrong. And there's a comedy act going on here and he's a busboy and he sees the fire in the front of the house in the zebra room and he comes running back here and goes right up on stage and tells people in a calm voice, you need to leave. Well, unfortunately, it was too crowded for a lot of people to get through the aisles. Others who had been drinking, naturally, uh, laughed it off, said it must be part of the act. Um, seconds made the difference in life or death because that fire was coming from the front of the house like a freight train down to the cabaret room where it would burst in with toxic smoke. People actually walked out of the cabaret room to the lawn outside and looked completely normal, but their lungs had been totally fried and poisoned with toxic materials from the fire, and they fell dead instantly. This is, uh, shows you what's going on the next day after the fire, and what you may notice here is look at the picture on the right and see how that front part, that gouge in the front, is the zebra room where the fire started. And you can see in the left-hand picture that the crane and uh, the bucket that went uh, um, to, to clear out the debris, immediately the first place they went to was the zebra room. There was a um, fire investigator for the state of Kentucky who came down and said, we need to rope this off, we need to put up crime scene tape, we need to investigate this as a crime. And the governor, who was Julian Carroll at the time, told him, according to this guy who's quoted in my book, told him, uh-uh, not going to happen. You can shut the bleep up. He put it in charge instead in the hands of the Kentucky State Police, who were under his thumb. Here we see a picture that was retrieved by two of the people who, by one of the people who survived the fire, David Brock. He was a busboy also. He has relentlessly pursued the truth about this fire. This picture was liberated from the Kentucky State Police about uh, 20 years after it was taken. Many of the pictures taken by the Kentucky Police have disappeared. This one was only um, liberated by a lawsuit, and it shows the basement, or lower level, right below the zebra room. Now, to understand this, you're looking at the HVAC system there, and you're seeing clear evidence of a fire, correct? Scorch marks on the left-hand wall. Uh, in the back corner, you can see a, a duct that is blown open by some kind of explosion. And yet, during those years, the Kentucky State Police still inv insisted that there was no evidence of, of a fire in the basement. Here's a close-up of that um, heating duct, cooling duct. Uh, the evidence includes this uh, letter that I found from the FBI. I did a Freedom of Information Act request, and the FBI uh, sent me three disks that were packed with information that was fantastic. A lot of it was illegal wiretaps on the mob by Bobby Kennedy. And I'm not sure anybody's seen those before. This letter is uh, from a man who came into an FBI office and said he was on a flight, and two men were sitting near him, and they were talking about burning the supper club. He went to the FBI and told him about it because that flight took place two weeks before the supper club burned. Here's a list also of nightclub fires caused by arson in northern Kentucky leading up to the 1977 blaze. You can see that every year a major nightclub was burned. In many of these cases, there was actual evidence of accelerant used. We, uh, police had, or 
Witnesses had seen the owners removing all their liquor the night before, which was a sure sign that the mob was moving in and that place was going to burn. All of these places burned in the, in the mob takeovers and the mob wars, and yet, here we go from to 1977 after this history, and the governor comes up and declares it's an accident. It defies belief. Among these, uh, this is just a short list of criminal evidence. I won't go through it because we're probably getting short on time. How are we doing, Brett? Um, so, but what it includes here is multiple witnesses who are quoted in my book saw two men working in the ceiling of the zebra room who claimed to be air conditioning repair guys. Well, there was no air conditioning in that room, and that's where the fire started. On and on it goes. And finally, we'll wrap up with this. This is a menu from the Beverly Hills Country Club in its glory days. This is signed by Ozzy and Harriet. The people who perform there are legendary. The list, it could fill two pages like this of people, and you would recognize many of the names. Of course, we're, our parents would recognize all of them, I'm sure. Um, so I guess for, if we have any questions, let's go ahead. Anybody have a question? Yes, Al? Wow. Oh, my goodness. My, my question is, uh, I was speaking to somebody that was uh, one of his uh, children was a cardinal across the country. Yeah. And uh, he was telling me that uh, one of the construction periods, they discovered a lot of bones and body parts and that sort of thing. I wonder if you had ever heard of it. So, uh, Peter, if you could just re repeat the gist of the question. Yeah, the gist of the question is, um, did they find a lot of body parts and bones when they were building the party source? Yeah, I mean, that's entirely possible given what was going on in northern Kentucky for years and years. People went missing routinely. Um, some went in the river. Bodies were found. If you go back through the old newspapers, it's almost commonplace to read about a body being found floating in the Ohio River with a, a chain around him. Or uh, it, It's really shocking. And, and what you go to there is when people read this and they come up to me at signings and so forth or they've read it or, or they hear about it, they say, you know, it's almost hard to believe that took place right here. And yet it did. It's true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've done your homework. Uh, that's, that's, um, I think that's a very good theory of what happened, that the timer that was set in the basement below the zebra room for this ignition device was meant to go off at 5 or 6 a.m. on Sunday morning of Memorial Day weekend when the place would be empty. <clears throat> Instead, it went at, off at 5 or 6 p.m. when the place was totally packed. Mm. And it's frightening to read the accounts of the survivors. Uh, I, the survivors I interviewed, none of them believe it was an accident. Yeah. So we, we, in addition to the questions here in the room, Peter, we're getting questions from those watching on Zoom. Good. And I've got a couple of those. Doug Bolton is asking, is there a so-called smoking gun that will prompt law enforcement to reopen this case? That's a great question. You know, that seemed to be happening in 1979 because these people like David Brock and Tom McConaughey and others had built up so much evidence from that previous page I showed you and, and much more. Uh, eyewitnesses who saw these things happen, who saw a conversation between the Schilling family and two unidentified guys who were scary looking, according to the witnesses, who sat in the bar and said that we want to buy your club. And the Schilling said basically, you know, get out of here, um, and we're threatened. So is there a smoking gun? In 1979, all of this evidence was compiled, including um, the, the evidence that one of the shillings, the wife of um, one of the shillings, had received a letter in her mailbox that night before the fire that said, you keep building, we'll keep burning. We're going to burn you out. I mean, these things are compelling. But the 1979, all that evidence was sent to a special prosecutor, again, appointed by the governor, and uh, what came of it was that they just basically dismissed it, and, which seems surprising. But when you examine, as I did, and find the politics that was surrounding this and the connections and the corruption at the top levels of the, uh, Kentucky's government, it's not surprising. Will it ever be investigated or opened again? Well, I hope, I hope something 
somebody like uh, Dateline or somebody comes along and says, let's get dig this up and brings more attention. And that's part of my goal in writing this too, is bring more attention, make people aware of what happened because history, especially regional history, is so important to understanding who we are and what we are and how we got here. And I have another question from a member on Zoom. Uh, Peter Weir is asking, uh, Peter, if you've received any threats or the like after publishing a book or during your investigation. No, people have asked me about that. Um, most of the big mob moved to Vegas, and many of them are gone. Uh, the two gentlemen, well, there's, I think that the David Brock and the others who worked on his book, which is really good too, um, they did receive some threats from what I understand. But at that time, some of these principles were still around. Um, as close as I could get to that, and this is really tangential, is I interviewed a paranormal um, investigator, basically what you call a ghost hunter. And she spent time on the hill and with all of her devices and related the various contacts with paranormal up there on that hilltop. And um, that was a very interesting little sidebar in the story that I think you would find very interesting. So, go ahead. Just repeat the um, gist he, of it. He, yeah, yeah he, he's, uh, he's referring to David Brock's book with um, Robert Webster and, and uh, Tom McConaughey. And uh, that book does name those people that they say were the ones who went in and set that fire and who set up the timer. I couldn't verify it. I wasn't going to bring them into it. I, I thought it was legally very risky, although I hear that both men have passed away now. I just thought it was legally very risky to bring that in. Um, and I think that's probably why David and others who did that book felt that it was a little bit risky. Um, those guys were affiliated with some uh, Cincinnati company of uh, heating and cooling. And uh, yeah, but they did name them. Yes. There's been quite a battle over that. Uh, the developers want to put assisted living up there. Um, the opponents say that there are still remains that may be there of the people who were killed in the fire. No doubt there are, there are ashes. The um, hilltop itself is pretty interesting. I've been up there about three or four times. And the ground is still heaving up objects. So you go up there and you'll find glassware and plates and and silverware and pieces of furniture or pieces of people's clothing, shoes, it's pretty creepy. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people on the other side, and that's evenly divided, and I'm kind of agnostic on it, because I don't have a survivor in this, they say 44 years is enough, that uh, it's time to move on and let that property be developed. So I hope, I, I guess that the, the the qualifier would be if the developer is respectful to their survivors and their families and those who are lost, which they say they will be, let it go. I have another question from somebody on Zoom, our member Deborah Schultz. She's asking, what happened to the civil litigation? Uh, the civil litigation is a whole most of book by itself. Um, as you may recall, uh, the legend locally is that Stan Chesley really got made his name off the ashes of the Supper Club. And I thought that was probably mostly myth, but as my investigation showed, it was true. He was the first, one of the first on the scene and literally pawed through the ashes looking for evidence, and his goal was to find the deepest pockets possible to hit the jackpot. The people who survived the fire, like David Brock and Shirley Baker and others who are in my book, Wayne Dammert, they said that they once told uh, Stan Chesley that it was arson, and he told them there's no money in arson. Shut the hell up. Um, that's just secondhand from them, but three of them said it. He, uh, as you know, if you follow his career, he's since been disbarred uh, for what he did in the Fen Fen case and others and he can't practice anymore in Ohio or Kentucky. Putting, it, putting what happened then in the context of this, 
my own personal opinion is that he, and I can show this in the book, that he went, continued to litigate for deep pockets until all had either settled and the only thing left was aluminum wiring. And that's where he settled. And his first trial was a failure to prove that. The second trial was almost a failure. The Consumer Product Safety Commission came in and said, no, it couldn't be. But nonetheless, he, he got a jury to agree that it was. Very much appreciated. Great, great talk. Great talk. Thank, Thank you, you so I'm, much. I'm going to sneak out of here and get ready to sign books for any of you if you feel compelled to buy one. So on the table uh, by the entryway uh, are books. Peter will be there to sign them. And Peter, before you exit the room, I just want to quickly say not just thank you for the talk, which was wonderful, and that's a reason I lost track of time. I was, I was engrossed in that talk. And I'm glad we had time for questions that it worked out that way. Uh, re really uh, important stuff, obviously disturbing to see how things have been handled over the decades, but what, what an education is in terms of what really did happen in this area, even for people who grew up here. Some of us didn't, but just uh, amazing. So thank you so much, and in appreciation of you speaking to our club today, we are going to make a donation to, Ro to Rotary International's End Polio Now campaign in your honor. And I know you've been to this Rotary Club when you were with the Enquirer over the years. You've been here a number of times. You know that's a campaign that Rotary has done over really since 1988 for many decades. So thank you very much for that. We really appreciate you coming, Peter. B big round of applause. And I just want to thank everybody for joining today. I, it's great to have people participating here in the room and on Zoom. And please join us next Thursday when Jill Miller, the president of Bethesda Inc., will be our speaker. Uh, in the meantime, have a great weekend, and may each person's Super Bowl team win. M meeting adjourned.